all other classes will be canceled, and that's extremely important. It's a very special time. Then our service of shadows will be on Friday night at 6 30. Again, that is one of the most special services I think that we have all year. That and the uh, Christmas Eve Lord Supper are probably two of my very favorite services. Uh, it prepares our heart and prepares our spirits, and so for, uh, for Easter Sunday. Don't miss out on that. And then, of course, Easter Sunday, we have our regular times. If you would like to come early that day, we'd really appreciate it because we expect it to be filled. So please come if you can at 8 30. If you can get up early and make it, we'd love to have you come. Also, uh, our men's retreat advanced. They've changed the age to 13. So 13 and over, and all the information is in there that's due by May the 6th. Uh, and the Armstrong offering, we only have a couple of Sundays left for that. So if you saw the the blip up there, please don't forget any Armstrong offering. We have so many things that we are asking for right now, but pray about what God would have you give for North American missions. And the North American missionaries need to say this for them. That is just about all of the announcements that I have today. It's a short day, Shane. Yeah. What up, Shane? Okay. So let's pray. Lord God, we, we praise your holy name this morning, Father, as we get close to our Easter season and Holy Week, Father, God, it's even closer to you. Show us, Father, how, how Christ did when Christ was personal, how you would have done it if I had been personal. God, you've been so wonderful and so gracious to us. And as we approach this Easter season, Father, we hope it's not to forget what it's all about. To sacrifice of your son to save us, to save me. And Lord God, I thank you so very much for your sacrifice. And I pray, Father, that you will use us this week to share your love for us with others, God. Send us out on mission. Show us who we need to reach. Bring this church in this way. Father, we just pray your help in Jesus' name. Oh, uh -huh. 
Thank you, guys. That was good. How many of you have a choice? Men, you have a choice for breakfast this morning? It was incredible. Thank you, men's team. And then a couple of weeks ago, and I failed to mention this, a couple of weeks ago, we had our, our car clinic. And, um, and the women's ministry were here, and they helped. Um, they prepared breakfast for the men. And, uh, and then they just hung around so they could just fellowship with everybody who brought their, their, their cars in. And, well, it was great. It was awesome. Wasn't it? Alright, 
And so, and we've all seen the Sunday school pictures of this. You know, there's Jesus having a conversation with the devil, and everything looks so peaceful. I mean, it almost looks like the perfect Sunday school picnic, right? And here's, and they're having a conversation together, right? That's not the way this probably went down, okay? So I want you to use your spiritual imagination here, okay? So Jesus is about to go into ministry. The devil has already tried to prevent the birth of Jesus. And then he has worked through Herod to try to kill all the babies, including Jesus, that were three years of age and down. So our, there's already been two attempts on the life of Jesus, and he's just growing up. All right? And then you have the responsibility of Mary and Joseph, and they leave Jesus in the temple at age 12, right? Um, so, hey, we're, if you've ever done that as parents, you're off the hook. Like, you know, even Jesus got left behind, okay? <laughs> um, so it's all good. All right, so, I mean, so the devil has already tried to stop Jesus in, in what he's doing. And he said, so he's had at least two failed attempts that we know of so far. And, and so now here's Jesus fasting. He's getting ready to launch his earthly ministry. And, and the devil is out doing his thing. And so the devil sees that, that here's the Son of God, but he's on the devil's home field. And, 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 and he's away from the Father. Jesus is alone. There's no disciples yet. There's no church yet. Now is the perfect opportunity for us to launch an attack against him. And so I, as I'm reading this, I'm not reading this as a war of words or a battle of the wheels. And this is not like, you know, an arm wrestling contest between God, two guys. This is mortal combat for 40 days and for 40 nights. Jesus is being tested. All right? And after the 40 days, 40 nights fast, we read that the tempter, tempter then, then comes. So let your spiritual imagination Go wild here, okay? With everything that's at stake. The mission of Jesus Christ is to go to the cross. The mission of Jesus Christ is to die, to bleed, to become the sacrifice for your sins. The mission of the enemy is to keep you in bondage, to keep you unforgiven, to keep you under the cloud of sin. To keep you separated from God. So there's a lot at stake. To me, as I read Matthew chapter 4, this is life and death. Not just for Jesus, not just for Satan, but for us. This is the ultimate test. Alright? So here we go, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. So then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and for 40 nights, he was... Okay, Matthew is Captain Obvious here, okay? He was hungry. All right? Can you say amen? amen? All right. So the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So then the devil took him to the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him again, It is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a, a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all of these I will give to you if you will fall down and, and you will worship me. Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And then the devil left him Notice this, and behold, angels came, and they ministered to him. And notice this. So what we see in Matthew chapter 4, this test is so severe, this battle so great, that the Heavenly Father, after it's over, sends his angels to come and to minister personally to the needs of Jesus Christ. By the way, we 
see this happen one more time, and it's in the Garden of Gethsemane before Jesus Christ would go and die on the cross. This is mortal combat. Life, your life, my life, is on the line. The devil's not just going to sit idly by and do nothing as Jesus prepares to become the sacrifice for our sins, to be the perfect sacrifice so that we can be forgiven, set free. So he's going to launch an attack against Jesus. So here's one of the things that, that I know. And I want to give you four things this morning from this passage of Scripture. There are four things that we must know if we're going to be successful against our battle against the enemy. Number one, we need to know who our enemy is. I see your pens, you're busy writing all of these things down because you want to get this, because this is life and death. It's important. You need to know who your enemy is. Number two, you need to know your weaknesses. Know where you're going. Number three, you need to know the word of God. And number four, you need to know your power source. Okay, so those are the four things that we're going to look at this morning. Did you know that the devil is a better theologian than most preachers? Did you know that? I, I want you to listen to what James says. In James chapter 2, verse 19, he says, You believe that God is one. That's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. That he's one. You believe that God is one. To paraphrase James' next statement, he says, Big deal. Whoop de doo. Even the demons believe and they, they tremble. The devil is a better theologian than most of us. The devil knows who Jesus is. The devil knows how powerful Jesus is. And the devil knows how powerful you can be if you decide to go all in, to put all of your hope and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows that because all authority was given to Jesus, all authority has been given to you. And since he decided that he's going to do everything that he can to stop the person of Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, he's going to do everything that he can to stop you. If Satan is not above doing hand-to-hand -hand combat with Jesus Christ, don't be surprised when he shows up at your doorstep trying to stop you from fulfilling God's call on your life. But know this. The tactics that Satan used on Jesus are the same tactics that he uses today. Shouldn't be a surprise to you what Satan is going to try to do as he begins to move against you in your life. So with that in mind, let's heed the advice of the Apostle Peter. This is what he says in 1 Peter 5 Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Be on alert, another translation says. For your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Know your enemy. Now, if, if you are a sports fan, you know that what coaches like to spend, whatever your favorite football team is, college football team or pro team, before, before the plane or the bus even leaves to head home, you have a group of coaches who are busy doing one thing. You know what they're doing? They're watching game film of next week's opponent. They're looking for our weaknesses. They're looking for strengths. They're looking for uh, certain plays that they run on offense or certain plays that they run on defense. They're studying their opponents. So if coaches know the importance of studying the opponents, you probably ought to study yours. So you need to know your enemy. Who is your enemy? Well, the, the Bible has a couple of names for him. In the Old Testament, he is referred to as Lucifer. In the New Testament, he is referred to as Satan or the devil. And all of those names indicate certain characteristics about him. So let's look at those characteristics. Number one, your enemy is called the great deceiver. In John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus is speaking to the religious leaders here. He says, you 
are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's <coughs> desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar. He is the father of lies. We see this on display in Genesis chapter 3. Verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field in which the Lord God had made. So then he, the serpent, said to the woman, As God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it. Not true. God never said anything about touching it. Lest you die. So the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for the for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate. She also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate, and the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed so two together. They made themselves coverings. The number one tactic of your enemy is to tell you that what God said is not true. Or to twist it, to manipulate it to a point where it makes it unbelievable to you. So he'll try to twist the word of God. This happens in pulpits all across the country too. It's not just worldly people that do this. Uh, that's why it's important number number. Three is that you know the Word of God. That you know the Word of God. So he'll twist it. He'll manipulate it. He'll even convince you that, hey, anything in the Bible that you don't like, just take it out. Just delete it. You know, I mean, after all, it's about how you feel. I mean, so anything that doesn't line up with your lifestyle, anything that doesn't line up with your habits, just go ahead and hit the delete button. It's all okay because God is still in grace. He's still got a mercy. And God loves you. And all of that's true. He has got a grace. He has got a mercy. And God does love you. But thank God he loves us enough not to leave us in the condition in which he finds us. Amen? I mean, we, we tend to forget that one of the things that Jesus says is unless you repent, you will not all likewise perish. That word repent means that I must make a choice to and I must decide to change. So he'll try to deceive us. Your enemy is also the great distractor. One of his tactics is to keep us busy. To keep us really, really busy. In fact, to keep us too busy. To keep us too busy to read the Bible. To keep us too busy to pray. To keep us too busy to go to church. To keep us too busy. Too busy dealing with problems, too busy dealing with kids, too busy dealing with sicknesses, too busy dealing with in-laws and outlaws. Just too busy. But never too busy to spend time on social media. Mm. To keep you too busy to spend time with God. But see, because if the devil can keep you too busy to spend time with your creator, then he can keep you from getting the feedings that you need, which makes you anemic, susceptible to his attack. So he keeps you too busy. He's the great distractor. He is also the great tempter. Matthew chapter one, or chapter four. Again, look with me in verse number one through three. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and after fasting. Forty days and forty nights he was hungry. Verse 3 says, and the tempter came. My dad kind of described it to me like this when I was little. So here's the devil. And he's got a tackle box full of lures. And he's fishing in a mighty big pond. Right? And there's all different kinds of fish out here. And, and so what the devil does is he just kind of studies what he did. And he said, hmm, it's a little cloudy today, the wind's kind of blowing, not a whole lot of light, so let me try this particular lure, see if I can get him to bite on this one. Ah, 
that, that one didn't work. Let's try a different one. Again, he's been using the same tackle box for years. These same lures for years. All right? Listen, I, I don't mean to burst your bubble, but you're not all that important that the devil is going to create a new lure just for you. Okay? Someone told me that. It made me so upset. <laughs> all right? <laughs> All right, I'm going to show you scripture for that in just a second. Okay? So bear with me. So here he's got this, and he's just going to keep dropping lures in front of your path until one day when your we, you decide to bite. And once you bite, he's got you hooked. And once you're hooked, it takes a supernatural act to get you set free. Thank God. The answer to the lures has already been here. Amen? Amen. And he knows to get you, how to get you unhooked without ripping your mouth all the pieces. Say amen. amen. All right? So you have the great tempter. Your enemy is also the great robber. Jesus described him this way. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He's the great robber. What does he want to rob you? He wants to rob you of your peace, rob you of your joy. He wants to rob you of your hope, to rob you of your purpose. He wants to rob you of your integrity because if he can rob you of your integrity, he can rob you of your effectiveness. If he can rob you of your effectiveness, he can strip away the effectiveness of your witness and of your testimony, making your words meaningless. He wants to rob you of your family. He's a great thief. And your enemy is also the great accuser. In Zechariah chapter 3 verse 1, Zechariah says this. It says, and then he, this is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit showed him, Zechariah, the, the high priest, Joshua, standing before the angel of the Lord. Okay, you get the picture? So now Zechariah, he has this vision, and there's the high priest, Joshua. And now there's Jesus, and to the right of Jesus... There is the accuser. Notice what it says. And Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. By the way, I wish you would write this verse down because you need to read verse number 2 and verse number 3 of that passage. And you need to understand what Jesus says in response to the accuser. It's really, really good. But look with me at Revelation chapter 12 verse 10. So then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren. He who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. So we have an accuser that stands before God 24-7. And every time you mess up, he said, you see that? You see what he just did? Did you hear what she just said? Hey, you talk about somebody with a mouth. Hey, that's one of yours, I believe, God. Did you hear what you just said? Uh -uh, I mean, hey, I can't believe you put up with that. Hey, did, did you see what he just thought? Did you see that? Did you get a glimpse of the thoughts that just went in? <laughs> the great accuser. And not only does he stand before God accusing you, but he'll also stand in one of your ears, whispering in your ears, I can't believe you just thought that. I can't believe you just said that. I can't believe you just did that. If you were really a child of God, see, you wouldn't be doing things like that. I mean, I can't believe God would even listen to your prayers. I can't believe God would even love you after what you've just done. You ever heard those kind of words? He's the great accuser. So not only do you need to know your enemy, but you need to know your weakness. See, in verse number 3, it says that the tempter came to Jesus after he had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And notice what the first temptation is. If you are indeed the Son of God, the all-powerful one, what would be wrong with you using your power to turn these stones into bread? You've got to be hungry. I mean, God doesn't want you to be hungry. He gave you the power to do it. Why not do it? <laughs> right? So just turn these stones into bread. He knows your weakness. All right. Let me, let me just give you this. I'm going to stick to my notes real quick because I'm running out of time. Where are your weaknesses? What is your kryptonite? 
Not only where is your weakness, but when are you the most weak? And when you get the answers to that question, let me encourage you not just to own it to yourself, but let me, let me encourage you to share it with someone else. And I'll, I'll tell you more why in just a second. So acknowledge it. Come to grips with it. Fortify it with the Lord's help. But learn how to build up your defense. So know your weaknesses. Number three, know your Bible. King David began to understand why the Bible was so important. He wrote Psalms 119 a short time after his sin with Uriah and Bathsheba. He began to understand, understand why the Bible was so important, why God's word was so important. This is what he said, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Why? Because God's word is powerful. So listen to me real quick. So when Satan said to Jesus, use your power to turn these rocks into bread, Jesus responded with the word of God. <clears throat> when Satan took Jesus up to the high place and said, hey, yeah, I'll put this in my notes, I'll just go to the When he sang Van Halen's song, jump, 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 <laughs> jump. <laughs> Living within you, 
to equip you and to empower you. You also have the body of Christ to encourage and to support you. You are not alone. Galatians 6, 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. James chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Who wants to go first? What well, none of us do. That, that, that's too hard. What, what will they say? What will they think of me? What will they say about me? It, isn't it strange? And let me just get on the soapbox just for a second. Isn't it strange that someone in this room could be struggling with out the drug addiction, alcohol addiction, porn addiction, or whatever, and they could go to some secular self-help group, and they could open up and share all about their experiences and be loved on and accepted, but God forbid they do that in the church because they're afraid of what we might think. Let me read this again. Confess your sins to one another. And pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Listen, I think self-help groups are vitally important. Twelve-step groups are vitally important. But man, I ought to be able to sit down with my brother with Christ and say, Hey man, James, I'm struggling in this area. Will you pray for me? James said, brother, let me lay hands on you and let me pray. Hey, but Mike, let me tell you, you're not in this alone. I'm here for you, man. You're not alone in the struggle because I'm here for you, man. And that's what I need. Mean. Maybe from time to time, James calls me out, hey, how are you doing in this year? Tell me a little bit about your schedule. Hey, let's hold each other accountable in this. And it works. And I don't have to worry about my brother running his mouth all over town. That would make him a gossiper. God's word has something to say about that. This ought to be a place, gosh, where we ought to be able to come in and be human. <laughs> and, and not celebrate our humanity, but celebrate the grace of God who gives us the power to overcome it. And how can we overcome it if we don't have an army? fighting for us. Amen? Amen? Sometimes we need to get over ourselves. Yeah. <clears throat> realize not only that you're not alone, but you realize that God has provided a way out. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation is overtaking you that is not common to man. Same tackle box, same lures for 6,000 years. Same. Nothing new. Same one. But notice this. But God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So in other words, when the devil drops that lure in front of you, your first instinct is to look for the exit sign. Amen? Look for it, because I promise you, if God is telling us the truth here, there is one. There's an exit sign. There's a way of escape. Look for it. So not only do you realize that you're not alone, not only do you realize that God has provided a way out, but finally you realize that your sins are under the blood of Jesus Christ. Psalms chapter 103, verse 11 and 12. For as high as the heavens are above, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. For as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Romans 8, 1. There is, now, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Settled. Sins are forgiven. So when the devil shows up to tell you about your past, you remind him of his future. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Number four. Not only do I need to know my enemy, not only do I need to know my weaknesses, not only do I need to know the word of God, but I need to know my 
my source of power. Look with me real quick in Ephesians chapter 6, and then we're done. Okay? Verse 10. Finally, be strong in your own strength. Be strong in your education. Be strong in your knowledge of what Scripture says. Be strong in your good works. Help me. What does he say? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Listen, it's not what I have to offer God, but it's what God has to offer me. It's not the strength in which I have, but the strength that I have in Him. So be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Verse 12, he tells us, yes, you have a real enemy. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces um, of evil in the heavenly places. Your enemy is real. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand, stand firm. Be strong. Know where your source of power is. Let me remind you. Just let me give you some of my favorite verses real quick. Uh, just write these scripture references down. Romans 8.37 <laughs> reminds us that we are more, more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 reminds us that we overcome him by the blood of Jesus. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. Jesus gave, his, uh, gave the disciples authority over all things. He reiterates that in verses number 7 and 8 in Matthew chapter 28, the verse before the Great Commission in verse 18, it says, All authority in heaven has been given to me. And then he issues the Great Commission. And so if God gave Jesus all authority, and Jesus then deposited it into his disciples, into the followers of Jesus, who has today, who has the authority and all power? We do. Okay? So where's your power source? Holy Spirit. It's right here. It's a breath away. It's your power source. Acts 1, verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So the next time your deceiver shows up, and he will show up, you just present him the word of truth. The next time the great distractor shows up, and he will show up, you just present him with spiritual discipline. The next time your tempter shows up, and he will show up, you just give him scripture, the word of God. The next time the robber, the accuser shows up, and he will show up, you just claim the blood of Jesus over your life and remind him it's all over. As Jesus Christ was dying on the cross for our sins, moments before he would breathe his final breath, he made this statement. It is <clears throat> done. Mission accomplished. In that moment, all of our sins had been transferred onto Jesus Christ. And when he breathed his last breath, he paid the penalty for all of our sins. Mission accomplished. And in that moment, not only were our sins forgiven, but our enemy was forever defeated. Charles Spurgeon said this, We do not fight for victory. We fight from victory. Now think about this for a moment. I don't know what's keeping you from being everything that God has created you to be. I don't know what it is that's keeping you on the bench and not getting in the game to serve, to minister, to share your faith in the workplace. I don't know. It may just be fear. Maybe you're afraid of what you might lose if you become what God wants you to be. But let me just put this in perspective just for a moment. And this is in my notes because this is what I had to ask myself. If Christ has already won, 
if my enemy has already been defeated, if the victory is already ours through Jesus Christ, then what do I have to lose? I cannot lose if I've already won. Right? And so why am I so fearful to speak a word for Jesus Christ? Why am I so fearful to take my workplace and look at it as my mission field? Why am I so fearful to take my school on and to look at it as my mission field? Why am I so afraid to look at whatever it is I'm looking at on a day in, day out basis? Why am I living in fear when I'm already guaranteed the victory? I can't lose if I've already won. Amen? So maybe it's time. Maybe it's time that the church starts behaving like we're winners instead of losers. What do you think? I wonder what that would do to our world. Not shaken to the very foundation. Not good for it. Let's pray to you. Oh God. Would you speak to our hearts right now? Lord, oftentimes, all of myself included, I come in here discouraged. I come in here defeated, deflated. Oh God, I come in here after doing six rounds of battle. And the enemy has gotten the best of me, and I'm exhausted and I'm tired of fighting. The problem is because I've been fighting. I've been fighting an enemy who's already been defeated. I'm fighting an enemy God that you conquered through the wilderness three years. Just learn 
able to lean on you and learn to lean on my brothers and sisters in Christ. There's no reason for me to go through life alone. So God, help me to swallow my pride. And help me just to admit, I need some help. I need some hope. I need somebody to love me through this. Oh God, thank you for this church. Thank you for what it means to me, what it means to others who are in this room. God, we still have a lot of work to do. So God, equip us for the better.